apartment E Edward 2. Roommate appears to be not breathing a 30 year old. Speed 19 yellow shows him right here cover. We have been on standby to go on a call when Team 10 gets a call that there's been an overdose somewhere here in San Diego County. And I mean, honestly, we knew it wasn't a matter of if, but when, because these are happening so frequently. Um, so this was the apartment that today this team responded to. Um, they tested some drugs that they found in that apartment where the person has died and it came up positive for fentanyl. The guy that leads this team says that they go on at least 250 calls like this every single month. This turned out to be one of them. And it became very real for us here when they brought down this person's body down those stairs right there um, in the body bag. And at about the same time, a friend of the person who died showed up and I, I can't tell you how intense this poor woman's cries were. Um, you know, asking why and how, and this is happening so often. This is just one example. No! 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 It's not a skill. Oh my God! San Diego County has become a national epicenter for fentanyl trafficking and seizures of this dangerous opioid at the border just continue to spike. The U.S. Department of Justice says there's more deadly fentanyl being seized by border agents right here than at any other of this country's 300 plus ports of entry. This is a, an epidemic that is really devastating our community. We're not going to arrest our way out of this problem. It is just too big. Out of all of my patients that are diagnosed with opioid use disorder, about 95% of them, their primary opioid of choice is fentanyl. Now it's like you take a pill and you're gone. And by now, you've probably seen pictures of the pills being seized. They call them blues for their color, or M30s for the stamp that makes them look like the common pharmaceutical grade painkiller oxycodone. And now there are rainbow colored pills being made to look like candy to entice teens and a younger demographic. But fentanyl does not always come in a pill form. It's a substance that is being mixed with just about every drug. In 2021, we had 12 kids under, you know, 17 and under die from a fentanyl overdose. I, that number is going to grow. You're, you're so imprisoned in your body and it's literally like, miserable it's miserable it's super miserable and there's nothing the only thing you can do to make yourself feel better is go get more this drug fentanyl it's like playing russian roulette so you may have heard san diego recently declared fentanyl a public health crisis the synthetic i've reported on the fentanyl crisis over the past few years but recently i started hearing more and more stories and it wasn't just in my job as a journalist but in my own community as well. Scary stuff for a parent, for sure. So I decided to take on this subject to better understand what's happening in San Diego. In the coming hour, you'll meet the people I spoke with. Parents who lost their kids, overdose survivors, academic and medical professionals, representatives of government agencies and activists. A lot of the information is worrisome. Some of it, flat out frightening. But you'll also get to hear from the people who are committed to fighting this battle every single day. It's a lot to take in, but it's also necessary for us to understand. When I first started researching, it didn't take me long to realize that fentanyl, an opioid, is now the leading cause of death for young adults. We're talking about 18 to 45-year-olds, people in the prime of life. Nothing else comes close. I looked at diabetes, cancer heart disease, car accidents, even homicide, COVID-19, suicide, not even close. Fentanyl is by far the biggest killer of young people. There are two types of fentanyl. Pharmaceutical, which is administered by medical professionals used in controlled environments like hospitals and through prescriptions. And counterfeit, which has no quality control and is sold illegally. That's what's ending up on the streets. In San Diego, 
53 kids between the ages of 14 and 20 have died from a fentanyl overdose within a recent 22-month period. One of them is Connor White. Connor's story is not the stereotypical drug addiction leading to a drug overdose story. At 17, he was a good student with a 4.2 GPA, an athlete, part of his school's football team. His mother, Laura, told me Connor was an overall really good kid. We, of course, we were very, very proud of him, but it was, that was, he was driven. He was driven. And he was driven in football, even though he wasn't the best player. And he knew it, but he showed up. Every, he, he showed up every time, every practice, and he, he worked hard. We played Pop Warner at Torrey Pines, and then, um, and then, you know, when he went to Cathedral, played freshman football, JV football. He played um, that COVID season on varsity at Cathedral, and then, you know, he wasn't there for the last season. Connor's dad, Matt, was his high school football coach and teaches AP classes at the school. He describes the day Connor passed away. So it was May 5th, uh, 2021. When I woke up, bathroom light was on, and, and he was in there. I could hear him. And I thought, oh, okay, so he's, he's getting ready. He's going to, he's, you know, he'll be at school. And so um, Connor was supposed to be in my class that day, and, um, and he wasn't there. And I texted him, and I, there was no answer. And um, so um, I called down to the office, and they sent somebody um, to cover my class, and you know, I'm a mile away. And so um, I got here. It was probably it was around 10:30 or so, and um, his car was here, and um, and uh, you know, I came in and checked his bedroom and the bathroom light was still on and I went in there and he was, he was passed out. He was out on the floor in the bathroom, no pulse, no breathing. Um, I called 911 and, um, and started CPR and, uh, and then the police, the police got here first and, um, and, uh, we did the Narcan. And, um, and then the paramedics came and, you know, they worked on him for like 30 minutes. And Laura, what do you remember from that day? I couldn't hug my child goodbye because he couldn't, he wasn't, they don't allow him when fentanyl has been taken. I said, I just want to hug him one more time. They said, no, you can't. Probably after I left at like 6.30 or something like that is probably when he took the pill. Now we know that um, that night he, you know, he had left to go to his friend's house and he picked up the pill from his friend or dealer or, you know, whatever we call him. And he, he waited until the morning and apparently he wanted to you know, go to school high or something. I mean, that, that's all I can imagine what his thought process was. And, um, you know, he got the poison pill. Connor's bedroom hasn't changed since. There's the whiteboard that he'd been using to help study for finals. Athletic gear, waiting for that next game that will never come. It was a Percocet. It was a blue M30 pill. You see, you know, whenever they do a a fentanyl bus, they show the blue pills with the M30 on it. Um, you know, that's, you know, obviously what it was. And, um, uh, you know, and that's, the world changed. You know, it changed real fast. For the White family, losing Connor happened unexpectedly. It seemed to me they were simply blindsided by the death of their son. But for the Lopez family, they battled with their 21-year-old son Zeke's addiction over a long period of time. It started with the Xanax, and then that progressed to um, Percocets. Zeke's mom, Christina, and his stepmom, Natasha, both spent a recent afternoon with me to share Zeke's story. He was going through a really hard breakup at that time um, with his longtime high school sweetheart. And they lived together in the Berkeley area, and he came back, and his depression and anxiety had um, went to an extreme that I had never had dealt with. Um, and so he was 
self-numbing, you know, through uh, Xanax. And it happened quite quickly after that, um, the level of his use and how you could tell that he wasn't doing okay. Yeah. So probably unknowingly, by trying to self-medicate, exposed himself to then these fentanyl-laced pills. Exactly, and that created an addiction that I've never have experienced. Um, this was a whole different uh, monster because he just could never completely stay away from it. It would be six months and then he would relapse and then it would be four months and then he would relapse. It was like the, that drug constantly called his name, you know, because it would just take away all that angst and anxiety and um, his, it, and, and quiet his mind for that moment. Despite all of his family's effort to keep a close eye on him, Zeke's battle with addiction continued. His mom described the day it came to an end. After work on the 13th, um, he went and um, picked up these drugs. Um, it was Xanax and um, fentanyl pills, uh, the pressed ones. He went home and um, we got the call on the 14th of May. We had been looking for him in the morning. He was supposed to be at work. And I, I, I just knew something wasn't right. Drove up there and I was the first one to get there. And there was two cops inside of his apartment. I immediately went to go run to his room. My, my friends and Natasha, we all, you know, held each other and like prayed over him. And um, yeah, a lot of it is a blur because I was in shock. I, I still am. I feel like I definitely have a PTSD over this. Um, Our last conversations was about him going to apply to grad school and going to fashion school in New York. Um, and he was just talented in so many areas. He could make clothes, he could write music. Um, and he just had a kind soul. You know, he was a good person. He wasn't a bad person. Um, and I just don't want parents to have to do what we did that day. And we had to go to a mortuary and pick up his ashes in a, in a little plastic box. And that was horrible. It's horrifying. It's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. You know, when someone passes away, people don't tell you about all the, the awkward things you have to do and choices you have to make. Um, you know, we had to see him in a body bag. And that was really hard. That was really hard to see him in a body bag. And then, and then them ask us, do you want to see him? That was a really hard decision. Because we didn't know what he looked like. Is that the last thing in your head that you want to see? It's been real tough. Every day feels like it's the first day. I know everybody says what time it'll get better, but um, at this point it doesn't feel because it doesn't feel real still. I still go to text them and not knowing, you know, like not, it doesn't compute because we were so close. We talked every day and texted all day long. Like we're, we, him and I were very close. I thought Christina and Natasha were so brave to talk about what happened to Zeke, especially so soon after his death. They are his voice now that he can't tell his own story. But there was also someone who could tell the family story from another unique perspective. Natasha's son, Isaac, who has struggled with fentanyl use. I did not expect Isaac would even be there that day, but he was. And after I'd spent time with his mom, he surprised me and said he would talk. Hey, Isaac. Thanks for uh, agreeing to chat with us. Yeah, no problem. Do you remember the first time you ever took a pill? Yeah, I think I was, I was probably like 15, 16, 17, 17 at the oldest, 16, 16. Tell me what you remember about that decision to do it the first time. What did you think you were taking? Well, these were, these weren't fake back then. These were actually real. This is before I even knew that existed. Got it. When Isaac says real, he means he started taking pills before they were counterfeit, meaning before they started getting laced with fentanyl. They want you to think that each pill is as potent as 
as the other when it's not all these pills are like super like what's it called um they're just inconsistent they're right? super inconsistent so it's almost like a you're getting mind tricked when you're doing them and you're like oh i just did four like i should be fine but sometimes those four could be like a super weak batch and then you're just chasing that dragon and chasing that dragon and chasing that dragon until you end up doing 20 a day and i was doing 20 a day i remember i i did 20 one day or like 25 one day and i literally still could not go to sleep i was trying to go to sleep so bad i just wanted to go to sleep i just wanted to go to sleep that's all i wanted to do this is a lot of people only do this so they can go to sleep good a lot of people have problems with sleeping and they want to take this maybe their first time they take it they take it to go to sleep or like doze off but then once you're addicted to it it's like you can't sleep without it the withdrawals are so bad for opiates like people say like oh why would you do heroin why would you do fentanyl that could kill you they don't realize that once you're so deep into it that doesn't matter it literally feels like it's going to kill you if you don't do it when I asked Isaac how many people he knows who've died because of fentanyl, he started counting. I could probably name more than my fingers. So there's Jesse, Tanner, Andy, um, Jonathan, Tanner. Two of my friends have overdosed in front of me, and I had to see them get Narcan. Um, I already have five. Five of your close friends. There's still more, though. I can't even drop like flies nowadays. It's just too easy, he told me, to get a hold of the pills. Now you can get one of those pills for cheaper than a pack of cigarettes. Cigarettes are $15 now. I remember those pills were like $20 at the most when they first came out. And now you can get them for like $5 each. And where do you get them? Just, there's tons. We're, at, we're literally at the heart of it all. San Diego, right next to the biggest border of the world. Like, they come, it comes through like candy. As I drove away after spending time with Isaac and the rest of Zeke's family, I kept thinking about that comment. It comes through like candy. I really wanted to get a sense of just how much fentanyl is actually coming here every day. So to get those answers, I went to the top when it comes to drug investigations. Special agent in charge, Shelly Howe. She's responsible for all DEA operations in San Diego and Imperial counties. There is such an overwhelming amount here because the cartels and the drug dealers are driving the addiction that we're not getting nearly as much as we should. And it's not because we're asleep at the wheel. We are attacking this at every single level. But there is, it's a numbers game. Um, we're at the busiest port of entry in the world. And, and these pills are, are also coming across, not just to stay here in San Diego, but they're gonna supply the rest of the country. Can you even begin to guess how many pills are making it past these seizures, if it's that high that you're seizing? I, I can't. I can't put a number on it because it's just, it's too high. We just see 600,000 in June, 600,000 pills. And that, that wasn't even, I hate to say this, but wasn't even that big of an investigation that that's what we got. And, and imagine every case that we do, we're missing, you know, hundreds of thousands of more pills. In 2021 alone, the DEA seized 20.4 million fake pills. In the first nine months of 2022, U.S. Customs and Border Protection law enforcement agencies in San Diego and Imperial counties seized 5,091 pounds of fentanyl. So I wanted to go to the front line of this battle and see for myself what's happening at the border. I reached out to Customs and Border Protection and asked if they would show us the work they're doing at the San Ysidro Port of Entry to prevent fentanyl and other illicit drugs from coming into our communities. That's where I met Officer Wilson Porter Carrero with the San Diego Field Office. Doing this with us today. Officer Porter Carrero gave us an extensive tour of the operation at the border. He showed us where 24-7 CBP agents are searching cars and people for fentanyl and other drugs. And so this is our vehicle secondary inspection lot. So if the officer detects or suspects illicit activity or maybe just wants a more of a thorough, more in-depth 
uh, inspection on a vehicle that he has, uh, he or she has, they'll send them into the vehicle secondary lot where they can kind of take their time, uh, maybe call for the canine to run around the vehicle and then uh, send it through our x-ray, non-intrusive inspection, uh, to kind of give more of a thorough look as well. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, our, as I said, the San Jose Port of Entry and, and, and the other ports of entries in the field office, we see daily anywhere from two to three seizures at a minimum, right? And it could be anywhere from uh, methamphetamine or fentanyl or heroin. And so we, we see this very commonly. Uh, and the, some of the methods that these drug tra trafficking organizations employ are pretty, uh, are pretty detailed, right? They'll, 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 um, they'll conceal the narcotics in certain uh, man-made compartments or non-factory compartments. We've seen uh, through the seats, the gas tank, the dashboard. They'll put it through the engine compartments and, and different, uh, different spots on the vehicle. Um, some of the weirdest places I've seen it is actually, unfortunately, uh, they would put it on um, a two-year-old's diaper and they'll line, the, they'll, they'll line the padding of the diaper with uh, methamphetamine. And so, you know, as a father myself, I, you know, that, that obviously pulls my heartstring because you're using, you know, a two-year-old to facilitate, you know, drug trafficking. And we've seen uh, anywhere from um, baby carriages, they'll, they'll, they'll line the baby carriage with narcotics as well. So there's no, there's no, there's no means to which these organizations will, will not go through. Nothing so, sacred. Nothing is sacred. That, that they will not bring something across. So unfortunately our officers have seen this and our officers check all the compartments and they have to be skeptical um, because you know, at this point we never know what we'll see. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of research on this. There's some really scary information out there that I think, you know, parents especially, but anybody really will think, this is so scary, what's being done to stop it? What would you say to people that are hearing about these huge amounts of seizures and this huge amount of drugs that's coming through right in our community, you know, what would you say to them about the commitment from your agency to try and stop it? Well, I think it's, it's, it's uh, also a personal matter for some of our officers that work here, right? We, we, um, we not only work in the area, but many of us are from the area and many of us have actually crossed the border and kind of know firsthand of some of the dangers that these narcotics uh, play in our communities. Right right now, the trend we see is some of the rainbow fentanyl pills are coming in, and some of the kids, you know, my own kids might, might see in, uh, in their schools. And so we take a personal, a personal position on ensuring that we can spread awareness, right, and, and, and detect this from coming in and, and not coming in, not just affecting the, the, the border communities, but more in the interior of the United States. Like we Chicago just happen to be the, the front line of it, right? Yes, <laughs> Here in San Diego. yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of our strategies here at CBP, specifically the San Diego Field Office, is we use a kind of a multi-layer enforcement strategy, right? So it doesn't just start at the primary inspection booth. We have uh, our anti-terrorism contraband enforcement team, right? So they rove that was called the pre-primary zone, which is an, a zone before the primary inspection booth. Like when you're booth. waiting in line to cross, Precisely, basically. yes. And it's still considered the U.S., right? So it's kind of a no man's land. And we also have our canine teams that kind of work out there as well. Right, and so even after after they pass the primary inspection booth, vehicles can be referred to secondary if the officer suspects um, some illicit activity, and then we have our obviously our non-intrusive inspection, such as our X-ray, and so these different layers of enforcement uh, kind of overlap over each other to ensure that we have our best chance of detecting some of this illegal activities from coming to the country and preventing it. Despite that multi-layered approach and the dedicated work around the clock to intercept as much drugs as they can. The reality is, a lot of fentanyl continues to get through and find its way into communities across the county and the entire country. And what makes this even more critical? More than half of the pills being seized are potentially deadly. The DEA analyzes seized pills for fentanyl levels and has found that six out of ten pills contain what could be a lethal dose. Not too far from just doing a coin flip between life and death. I'll give you another statistic that, that is just as terrible. In 2021, DEA alone, the only agency, seized enough fentanyl to kill or have a lethal dose for every single American. On average, fentanyl kills two people in San Diego County every single day. And across the U.S., one person dies from a fentanyl-related overdose every 8 minutes and 57 seconds. The DEA says this is one of the strongest opioids available. Why would they make it at these lethal doses where they're basically killing their customers? It seems dumb for business at the very least. But it's highly addictive. And the cartels and the drug dealers are driving addiction here in America. Why is it that some pills can kill someone and right next to them their friend is fine? Well, it's not made in a legitimate lab. 
this is made in laboratories down in Mexico that aren't legitimate. And each pill isn't, isn't measured on how much fentanyl is, in, is dispersed evenly around this pill. So one side of this pill may contain all of the fentanyl that is packed with inside this pill, and one side may not. How do you know? And maybe nowhere in the entire county are the consequences of that more obvious than here. We're in the toxicology laboratory at the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office. Dr. Steve Campman is the county's medical examiner. His office keeps track of the deaths across San Diego. I wanted to hear more from his perspective about this deadly trend. Not even five or six years ago, the whole year had only 16 deaths. And now we'll have 16, you know, in two weeks, um, a month, 50 or 60 or 70 or even more. So it, it's been a huge increase. Back in 2016, the ME recorded 33 fentanyl related overdose deaths in San Diego County. But by 2021, that went up to about 817 deaths. Do you do an autopsy on anybody that's a suspected fentanyl uh, poisoning case? That's actually our pref preference. Uh, we'd like to do that, but right now we're not able to do that. There are so many deaths. It's a huge problem. Um, the message is out there. Like fentanyl is deadly. Um, using drugs not from a pharmacy is deadly. And certainly pursuing the use of fentanyl illicitly is deadly. I don't know uh, how else to tell people. You seem like you're frustrated a little bit that maybe the message isn't getting out there. Well, I am. Um, it's just deadly. There's, um, we hear every day that um, people use fentanyl on purpose, and I just can't understand that. The reason Dr. Campman is saying that is because fentanyl can be an effective prescription pain medication used regularly by doctors, mostly for patients with really severe or chronic pain or to manage pain after surgery. But in recent years, drug dealers started sneaking it into other drugs because it's so cheap, potent, and extremely addictive. As a result, people have been tricked and hooked. And today, the world of fentanyl has drastically changed. I was finding out that means that people who are trying to stop the bad guys are having to dramatically change their game plan. Because of all that's happened, you as an agency are doing a totally different job in some ways. Yes, DEA's mission is to go after the large cartel networks. And we've, we had to change that in 2018 because of of the fentanyl overdoses that we were seeing here. And our agents aren't made to go to scenes where there are, are victims deceased. We're not a homicide unit. So it's taken a toll on, on our agents because of, of how many responses we've had to go to. But yet it's so critically important for us to go after the dealers, which is, is very new for DEA. Part of that includes leading the region's overdose response team, Team 10, as some call it. We have to triage the phone calls that are, that are coming in because there are just so many. The team responded to this overdose in Sarah Mesa in July. Agent Howe told me the team is now prioritizing fentanyl overdose scenes where there's a chance they can actually recover evidence that could help them A, get other lethal pills off the streets quickly, and B, go up the distribution chain as far as possible. Before that, uh, these accidental overdose deaths largely went uninvestigated. So there would be an overdose death, medics would be called, the police would show up, they would write a short summary report, um, and there would be no real follow-up investigation. James Fontaine is the chief of the major narcotics division at the San Diego County District Attorney's Office. And now a big part of what we're doing is the fentanyl. So he gets involved once these cases make it to the justice system. The dealer's normally getting their fentanyl from someone else as well. So how high up in the chain can we go in terms of our investigation? We have low-level street dealers, we have mid-level dealers, and then high-level dealers. And it, a lot will depend on, on where you fall within that chain uh, as to how aggressively you are prosecuted. Uh, but then on the most egregious cases, we've charged homicide before, and that means voluntary manslaughter. That's uh, punishable by up to 11 years in state prison. Uh, and uh, murder, 
even as a second degree murder and get 15 years to life on that. I didn't have to look very far for examples of this relatively new crackdown on people selling fentanyl. We'd reported on the arrest of Brandon Shepard at the Claremont Suites Hotel. He ended up being sentenced to nearly 14 years for his role in the death of 18-year-old Paris Rodriguez. The feds say he sold Paris a gram of fentanyl for about $100. They smoked it together in the hotel room, and Paris overdosed. She survived, but she died a few days later after smoking some fentanyl resin Shepard gave her. And then, just when I was in the middle of research for this project, a judge sentenced a La Jolla man to 15 years in prison for providing the fentanyl-laced pills that killed a woman, a woman who happened to be the daughter of Doug Manchester, the wealthy developer behind the San Diego Marriott Hotel, the Manchester Grand Hyatt, and the Grand Del Mar Resort. The father of Sally, who remains with us each and every day, so from the courtroom to investigations out on the streets, agencies across San Diego realize what an enormous problem we have on our hands. And everyone I met seems to think it will get worse before it gets better. What keeps you up at night? Not doing enough. I, I don't know how else to convince people. I have three little kids myself and they can sit right in front of me on the couch and they can order whatever they want using emojis. And if you're not paying attention as a parent, it's happening right in front of you and you're none the wiser. That's because teenagers and young adults can easily access this stuff through popular social media platforms like TikTok, Snapchat, and others. Drug traffickers are advertising these drugs using emojis and code words. The DEA has even put out an emoji decoder showing what these emojis mean. A rocket ship can mean high potency. A cookie can mean large batch. I wanted to learn more about how all that works. And is anyone even monitoring all that's going on online or doing anything to stop it? So I headed over to the San Diego Supercomputer Center on the UCSD campus, where I hope Professor Tim Mackey could help explain. He's using these incredibly powerful computers to detect and monitor millions of social media posts and other content on the Internet. The goal is to take that vast amount of information and make it useful for law enforcement and social media companies trying to get a handle on this. What do parents need to know about what's out there if they are like, what do you mean my kid can get some kind of pill on Snapchat? Like, explain what's going on really out there. Yeah, it's really daunting. Uh, I have a, I'm a parent myself, 8 and 10 year old, but I'm not at that age, but I can understand how parents may not even know what's going on, which is drugs are everywhere on the internet. And he told me, so are the advertisements for drugs. What does an ad look like on yeah. social media? So ads are very different. Some of the ads are very you know, similar to what you would expect, which is a picture of a drug, and you know, maybe some writing on that ad talking about which drugs they're offering. A lot of times drug sellers want to show that you, they have the product so that uh, you, they're not being scammed or uh, something else. Uh, some of the ads are more creative, like we have one ad with SpongeBob and shows all the different uh, drugs of where, where SpongeBob maybe look different if he's Depending you know, on the drug, drug he's yeah. doing? Okay. Mm -hmm. Some of the drug dealers don't use very overt marketing. They'll uh, wait for people to have a discussion about drugs, and then they'll come in to those direct messages or into those channels through comments and say, hey, do you want to buy a drug for me? It seems like the drug dealers now are like taking payments through these apps and then even arranging for delivery at people's home mm -hmm. through these different online platforms. Is that really what we're looking yeah. at now? Absolutely. We see evidence of people shipping product and having FedEx numbers and shipping labels and saying something like a code word about when the product is delivered to a doorstep. We have drug dealers that have reviews. We have drug dealers that have tracking numbers for the product that they ship. And we have drug dealers that uh, are, you know, very multi-marketer. They have an Instagram account. They have a Snapchat account. They have uh, a Telegram account, etc. They're selling all over the place. So the odds that your child is going to be exposed to this content can be relatively high, especially if they're looking for hashtags that are related to drug uh, you know, terms. So it's very important for parents to know 
that there's a lot of content out there and your children can get exposed to it pretty quickly. That is definitely alarming to hear. But Professor Mackey says right now his research group is working with partners, including authorities and social media companies, to try to prevent people from being exposed to this type of content. So as I walked away, that gave me hope that there are efforts out there trying to protect our kids. But there was something else I still wanted to understand. What was it about this particular drug that was turning out to be so devastating? Could science help break down why fentanyl has turned into a public health emergency? I kept thinking back to something Isaac said to me. They say, oh, why do you do fentanyl? Like, you could literally die if you do fentanyl. Like, the people that are doing fentanyl don't think that. They think, they feel like they're going to die if they don't do it because it's that addictive once you're that in that hole. To understand the science behind fentanyl, I reached out to someone who specializes in opioid addiction, the head of substance use disorder for San Isidro Health. I visited Dr. Aleka Heinrichy at her clinic, and she told me the number of fentanyl users visiting her has skyrocketed. Could you give us a sense of how big the fentanyl crisis is right now in our community? Because you're in there seeing it every day. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what's really interesting is that we've been able to watch this in real time because, um, so the beginning of 2020, I would say that out of my patients that had opioid use disorder, about 80% of them, 85% were using mainly heroin. Uh, another 10% were using illicit or illegal prescription opioids. Those are things like oxycotton, oxycodone, Vicodin. And then the rest will say like 5% or so were using fentanyl, knowingly using fentanyl about a year into the pandemic, and it's not related necessarily to the pandemic, but it was just the timing and that's how I think of things in my mind, mm -hmm. we saw an immense shift to now, out of all of my patients that are diagnosed with opioid use disorder, about 95% of them, their primary opioid of choice is fentanyl, 95. So that went from 5% to 95%. That's the patient population that we're seeing. And I, I have had uh, young adult patients and adolescent patients report, you know, these are folks that were maybe, you know, experimenting with alcohol or cannabis and they're at a party and their friend offers them the pill. They're not aware that it has fentanyl in it. And uh, if, because they've never used opioids, they have no tolerance. And so they're really, really susceptible to having an accidental overdose and if, as well as susceptible to creating an, uh, an addiction or going on to have dependency to, to fentanyl. And they're hooked almost right away. Very quickly, very quickly. Fentanyl is synthetic, it's made in a lab, so it's extremely potent. It also has a very sh fast oncoming of symptoms and then it kind of drops off very quickly. Uh, that's, the, that's the easy way to explain it. So the feeling, the effects go up really fast and come down really fast. And that's important because we know when we're looking at the actual physiology of addiction and how addiction starts, the faster something comes on and comes off the receptors, the, usually the more addictive it is. I also asked Dr. Heinrichy to explain what happens to somebody's body when they overdose on fentanyl. The most concerning ones as a physician is the fact that the heart rate and the respiratory rate or the breathing rate slows. And when the breathing rate gets low enough, we're no longer able to oxygenate our vital organs, including the brain. And so that's really what's happening during a fatal overdose. She told me she'd like to see Narcan, also known as naloxone, widely available, a drug that can quickly reverse the effects of a fentanyl overdose. No, the way naloxone works is it actually goes into the same receptor that the opioid sits in, but it has a higher affinity to bind there, meaning it just like really wants to go there very strongly and it will actually kick out the other opioids that are present. So if someone has fentanyl or heroin or methadone or another opioid, it will kick it out and uh, it, the fentanyl will, or excuse me, the Narcan or the naloxone will bind to that receptor and it will stop the cascade of events that was causing the respiratory rate to go down or that breathing rate to be really slow. Uh, so it works instantaneously if the dose is high enough, but sometimes you have to give multiple doses for it to work. 
When I was looking further into Narcan, I found another vocal advocate for making it much more easy to find in a lot more places. On Instagram, he goes by the name Narcan Nate. I called Nate Smitty to see if we could meet up, and he agreed to let me join him in Oceanside to see him at work. You're in the trenches dealing with this every day. Um, how how bad is it? Like, really, what's going on out there? I mean, we have a t we have, so we have a tainted drug supply. That, that's what it is. Every week, Nate sets up in this parking lot, along with a nonprofit that offers hot showers, a meal, other resources to folks on the streets. Nate hands out care packages, basically. They always have Narcan, and he makes sure people know how to use it. Nate also includes testing strips that can detect drugs laced with fentanyl. It's all part of a concept called harm reduction that I've been hearing come up quite a bit. The idea is that the priority should be keeping users alive long enough so they can seek treatment and treating people with substance use disorders with dignity. Recently, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a bill that makes it legal to possess testing strips. But experts say that while fentanyl testing strips can tell you if there is fentanyl in the substance you're about to consume, they cannot tell you how much fentanyl is present. Opponents say test kits and Narcan like little, simply enable drug like users, like prolongs like their addiction, and delays treatment. As for Nate, for he insists seconds, that these test strips save lives. It's, it's like another measure to ensure that people are safe. You know, and so, do you feel like people really do use those? They cut. I, I gave out almost 200 in three days. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. He speaks from experience. Nate told me he's overdosed twice. The first time I overdosed, it was when oxymorphone came out, which is an opana. It's, it's a it's a it's a pain pill, and I had never done them before. I had sold them, but I didn't know they were extended release. And so I usually took rox, roxycodone, which is like it's, a, it's oxycodone. It's just a pain pill. Um, it's narcotic, and I was usually doing those. I was doing like 10 of those a day, if not more, if not more. and um, I was like low on them. So I took what I had, and I took one of the Alpanas, and I didn't know it was extended release. And then I was like, why isn't this not hitting me? And then I took just took like two or three more, and the next thing I know, I just fell out. Wow. Yeah. Um, how, how did you, what happened after that? How did you recover um, from that? I woke up 26 hours later and I thought it was the same day. Yeah. Uh, and that wasn't the only time? No, the, no, yeah. The, there was, it was in 2018. Mm -hmm. It was the next time that I overdosed, yeah. And I got saved by Narcan that time. Yeah, I just relapsed and done some, some dope and it was cut. It was yeah. cut with? Uh, fentanyl. I mean, I'm assuming fentanyl. it's fentanyl, yeah. yeah. So Narcan has saved your life? Yeah. Nate will tell you, if anyone should have known the dangers of drugs, it was him. His dad was a police chief where he grew up. The just say no to drugs message was everywhere he looked. But he says that didn't stop him from experimenting. I don't know, at that point it was just something to do. I was just like young and in school and partying. You know, I, I made good grades in school. I had like a 3.0 GPA, got into college. What Nate did not realize is that what started as something to do would quickly lead him to a very serious battle with addiction. The first time I tried opiates, I was immediately hooked. My, my thought was, I have to do this every day, and I did. On my best days, I would, be, I would think, I'm not going to put anything in my body today. And I would do, I, the, like, the best intentions to change, and I just couldn't do it. And, and it, like, the, the grip of it, you know, the, I, I would go to score, whatever it was, and I, wouldn't eat, I would have it in my pocket, and I would already feel a therapeutic effect just by having it in my pocket. It's not entered my system yet. That's how crazy it is, you know? And then when I wasn't, when I wasn't, like, I would already be, like, I would be loaded, I would be high, and then I'm thinking about the next time I can get one, the next time I can get one. Like, it rewires our brains. Like, it rewires our neural pathways. Like, I never, I never wanted, like, I slip on a couch covered in, in dog shit. Like, it had dog shit tracked on it and piss in this trap house, you know? I never wanted that for myself, you know what I mean? That's not where I see my life going. It's just, it just happened. You know what I mean? I didn't, want that. I, didn't want to be, I didn't want to be addicted to anything. I was just experimenting like just people do, and it happened. And he struggled for yeah. years yeah. to quit. It's hard. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. You know, I'm, you know I wanted to kill myself before I got clean this time and uh, did, it, did it for eight years. Nate says he knows some people may hate what he's trying to do, but he doesn't see any other way. People have this idea like they think I enable people. I'm just enabling people to live longer, to have a chance, you know what I mean? Because I know they're going to do whatever they want to do, you know? And it's like, 
why don't we try this? We've been doing the war on drugs, the prison system, punching people, punitive measures, all this stuff, and it just doesn't work. While Narcan certainly works very effectively in cases of overdose emergencies, I was curious about what treatment options were available to those struggling with fentanyl addiction. There are three medications that are FDA approved for the treatment of opioid use disorder that have shown to be very effective at reducing uh, folks from using as well as reducing all the negative impacts in their life when they're using and just reducing death, their risk of death. So those are methadone, buprenorphine and in various forms, and naltrexone. These medications should be readily available to everybody, everywhere. Should be, but are they? I asked Dr. Heinrich if access to adequate health care for fentanyl addiction is easily available. Access is, is extremely important. So we recently have been through this huge health emergency pandemic. And we've seen how providers, doctors, community members, politicians uh, are able to motivate and, and really get behind a public health initiative to help save lives. So we know that that kind of response is possible. Uh, unfortunately, with the opioid epidemic and now what's becoming a fentanyl epidemic, mainly, uh, we're, we're not able to to have that same kind of mo uh, movement and, and motivation. And I think a lot of that just has to do with the, the stigma, the lack of understanding and awareness of just how common this problem is and, and what we need to do to address it. So when we're creating programs to help treat people with a fentanyl use disorder, opioid use disorder, we, we wanna have uh, what's called low barrier care. So we want patients to be able to be connected to a provider, uh, uh, preferably a board-certified addiction specialist um, or somebody or a primary care provider or a psychiatrist that has very good understanding of how to treat addiction. And we want them to be able to get medications right away. We know that these medications save lives, so we don't want to delay treatment. There's oftentimes we talk about a window of opportunity when someone's motivated to get help and motivated to change. And if we miss that window of opportunity, it could be deadly. In Isaac's case, he receives a monthly shot of a prescription drug, Sublocade, which prevents the effects of fentanyl, even if he were to use it. But it took more than two months after Isaac's mom, Natasha, took him to the ER to go through the process and get on the prescription. So it's basically like the birth control of drugs, blocks it, it's a complete wall. Even if I use, I don't get sick. It's like the first time I got the shot, I thought I could use, I tried using, it didn't work at all. It was like a waste of, it just went into no, like nothing. Like I wish they could give everyone a shot right when they go to the hospital for withdrawals, but it's it's not possible. Like it's, it's money, it costs a lot of money, insurance and all that. It can be a very hard, uh, a very hard system to navigate if you're just one day say, I want treatment and actually I don't even know where to go. Uh, you might go into a clinic and go to your primary care doctor and they'll say, oh, you know what, I've heard about these medications. I'm not, I don't have the special DEA waiver to prescribe them, so let me see where I can get you. And then they m might need to call around and say, oh, well, first you need to have an assessment by a counselor and then you might maybe need to see a therapist. So it can be, there's a lot of barriers that we put uh, in front of our patients before they're able to get treated. So bottom line, we can do better. We can do much better. And doing better is exactly why the families of Connor and Zeke wanted to tell their stories, to try to help the community wake up to what's happening and do a better job fighting it so that other families don't have to go through their pain. Well, I hope Connor's story makes a difference. And I'm, I'm sure at least, like you said, at least save one child's life or hopefully more. But I hope that, you know, what we share and we continue to have these conversations with others um, will make an impact and um, help other families. We have to move away from the stigma. Um, we, we assume it's not gonna be our child, right? And it's, it's tough, it's tough when you realize, yeah, it is your child, um, but you gotta get ahead of it. Like Matt pointed out is, um, You've got to start to have the, those conversations very early, very young. Addiction 
doesn't discriminate. So it doesn't matter whether you live in a gated community, whether that you're the CEO of a big company. Um, we used to think of drug addiction or drug use as an inner city problem that just affected certain demographics. But with these new drugs, um, pills, uh, everything, Xanax, Percocets, Oxycontins, they're in every community, they're in the suburbs. Um, and you always think it's not gonna happen to you. Um, we never thought that this would happen to us with Zeke, never in a million years. And um, the way that we can honor him is by helping other people. The battle with drugs is often told by numbers. Numbers of those who've died, those who are addicted, the number of drugs being seized, people arrested or sentenced. And while the numbers help quantify the problem, they do not account for the countless lives this battle impacts because you cannot quantify the pain, the suffering this ongoing struggle causes every day. Beyond the numbers are real lives changed by this fentanyl crisis. After spending weeks with people affected by this fight every day, three main things became clear to me. This is a massive fight, and we are only at the beginning. It's not going away anytime soon, and things may get worse before they get better. Also, all of the agencies, the people really involved in trying to keep our families safe, they all say they need more resources, and they need more people to pay attention to what's happening. And while this battle continues, educating ourselves about fentanyl, how it works and how it affects the brain and human behavior is paramount. So is having these conversations within our families as difficult as they may be. The journey I have been on for the past many weeks has opened my eyes and helped me open up and have an honest dialogue with my son. Having this conversation is my first line of defense. Because I would rather you know what is really happening out there because it's serious. It's really serious. 